sucks. It's just about, right. And I think in that posture, if I go into a meeting and I'm like this, what are the chances somebody's like really going to try to like, right. you know, As push my to, buttons right, where if I'm right, like exactly. this, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more open to criticism. Right. But like this, I'm not. So I think that there's like something to be said about strengthening that. Not only that, like again, we have all these mm-hmm. faculties mm-hmm. in the front that can protect us. Sure. It's really back here that we need like the most, like more of the strength. Well, and from the physical body, this, this is, is our soft. Oh, and we'll just we'll, we'll wrap with this, but like also physiologically, all of our soft stuff is on the well, the called the ventral side. Like all of our soft, vulnerable parts are here, and all the hard stuff is on our shelves on our back. Mm. Right, so we're gonna. I mean, people who are like this, they're you know they're this. They're protecting their heart. They're protecting their self empowerment, yes. their guts, their reproductive organs, yep. whatever. So it's an emotional closing in that's yep. occurring. So people who are wounded, been traumatized, but whatever, you'll see more of this thing happening uh-huh. because they're emotionally and energetically wounded, so they're protecting themselves. Uh-huh. So to do this is an, oh my God, what, no, because this is scary, because I've been wounded and hurt my entire life, and you're telling me to stick yeah. it out and and you're just, and you're just asking them to pretty much commit emotional suicide at that point, because that's, you, you're gonna, you're gonna hurt me, because their belief is you are going to hurt me, it's not a matter of if, it's it's not when, but yeah. it's when. And it's funny, because that's right. what invites more. Right, exactly. Well, let's get started. Yeah, so now. within right. that, that's a beautiful sort of like incoming in. To we're this for we're sure. gonna get going now just because yeah. we got people on live. <laughs> I need to know the best thing, so let's get going here. Yeah. Well, good. You need a well, for all, everybody on live, I'm Jason Kendrick. This is Brian, do your last name? Truskowski. Truskowski, I wasn't even trying to murder that. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll link it in at the end. Yeah. So this is Man Speak for Women, and the whole idea behind this was we wanted to take what we were learning as men, as the new divine masculine, about how our minds work and the things that I'm discovering and bringing to you ladies so there's some awareness around it. And also because we wanted to pick your brains and find out what you have questions about because I would like to take your thoughts and your questions and take them back to the men. I know Brian had similar things, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah. So <clears throat> my name is Brian Truskowski. I'm a life catalyst. Uh, which is personal growth, self-empowerment, education, you know, nature-based therapy. I take people outside into the woods and help them kind of reconnect with themselves. Um, and I do that one-on-one. I do that in groups. I teach classes. Um, and you can find me on Facebook, you know, my website. And I'm also a body worker practitioner, does therapeutic body work, emotional body work, energy work, cranial sacral therapy. So I work with people in their physical bodies to help them, like, I help educate people, help them take care of themselves. So the saying I have is lead a horse to water, teach them how to fish, which is like I really want to give people tools so they can take care of themselves. So in that, I work on them physically and help them tap into what they're wanting to go emotionally or energetically to do. And if we just want to stay superficial and physical, we can do that as well. So, But this is also part of my evolution is doing talks and communicating and Helping and helping to bridge a gap. I've also been a part of the Mankind Project for the last four years, which is I don't know. Are you any of you familiar with it? Probably not. So it's a it's a con. Well, some women are, but it's it's a conscious men's group that is international. It's been around since the mid '80s, so we're over 30 years, and we offer um, a 48-hour intensive men's training workshop. And basically, they get to go really deep and look at their own shadows, their inner child work, so on and so forth. And there's also these weekly support circles here in Denver and worldwide that I've been a part of. And so we really it's about developing emotional intelligence and literacy, giving men support groups that deal with men's issues, and um, really kind of working from the warrior archetype. So like that sort of like power control, like how do I get you know, control of my own self? And it's really potent. I'll talk more about that later on. Um, but it's been really potent for me, and now I actually staff the weekends that kind of help men go through it, and we've been doing that for about four years as well. So it, it's a really potent work. So like it's men doing their work so they can be healthier. And honestly, that's kind of why I'm here, because I want to learn from the other side as well, um, because you know, there's a saying that I heard at one point is um, domestic violence starts with men, because like it's – you know, the man's side that we need to like work through our shadows and our BS and our traumas and everything that we've had. Because once I have seen, once men figure out their story, then there's less outward energy flowing, you know, in the negative realm. So if I understand that, oh, I was abused because of this, that, and the other, then like, oh, I'm not going to repeat that pattern. Okay, I'm only going to heal it and 
have healthy relationships with the people. So, so that kind of ties into this, how I'm wanting to like learn the full circle so that I can work with my own stuff, but also to help my clients and, and like, like Jason said. Like, oh yeah, and that's the whole idea around this is we want to bring awareness because what I'm finding is a lot of us just don't know. You know, going through a lot of the personal development stuff I've done, there's basic personality types, there's communication types, there's different things that we're just not taught. And then you, you add that different personality types to the masculine feminine dynamic, and there's different things we're just not even aware of. And then we're going out blind into the world, wondering why we're struggling with communication. Wondering why, you know, I'm talking with you, and I say something, and you get upset, and, and then we do the old man, what did I say? What happened? <laughs> What's wrong? And... Mm -hmm. It's just this lack of awareness. And what I'm finding in the more work I do, the more I work with people, the more, as soon as they're aware, it opens up this whole new world. Like, oh, I didn't know that. And then we can start the dialogue. And that's what I'm really finding is that having an open dialogue and having tools to open that dialogue is so helpful. And it's just this lack of awareness, lack of education. I almost feel like this is one of those things that should be added to schools, just like taxes and checkbooks and credit cards and things that we actually have to deal with as adults that isn't taught to us and we figure out on our own just like relationships and communication and how we deal with the opposite sex because we for a lot of us we want to have some sort of partner whether it's same sex opposite sex or whatever but there's still a dynamic and there's lots of great books and things out there i mean way of superior man you know no, no more mr nice guy the mass of masculinity um winner from mars winner from venus i mean there's things that touch on these subjects but most of the time, at least from my experience, what I've seen, we don't go there until after there's a problem. We don't go there until, oh, well, I'm already in this relationship and it's starting to fail and I would like to educate myself on how to keep it going. But I would like to preemptively start educating prior to that and get a conversation going about what do you have questions on? What is it, what have your struggles been? And we can touch on where, what that relates to, what my experience is, and then get this dialogue going because I've noticed, and I, I meant to do this, I wanted to print out a yin-yang, you know, the divine masculine, divine feminine connected, but what I've seen is, and what I feel like we're doing is splitting those apart, turning them so that the masculine and masculine sides of ourselves are butting heads, and the feminine feminine sides of ourselves are butting heads, so we're not fitting together like we're supposed to, in that nice circle where we fit, and there's this nice harmony and flow, and so, I gotta do it, so. Well, so, well that, that's that's the, the gist of the visual. So I want to, because I like to keep things in, in flow and, and keep the energy really moving and getting to what we need to, to actually talk about, because I could sit up here, and I know Brian and I could sit up here and just throw information at you. What I'd really rather do is have you ask some questions or tell me what's on your mind, what you want help with, or what you have you want awareness around. Because, you know, talking at you isn't going to do you as much good as talking to you. Or, yeah. or yeah, another way of phrasing it is what brought you here. Yeah. Yeah. What what, what brought you here? What, what would you like to learn? Yeah. All of yeah. The hundreds of you that are here. <laughs> well we have you know, we have a bunch of people online as well, so and I'll do my best to keep up with are online. They live? Are you on Facebook? I'm live? on Facebook Live as well. Oh sweet. Yeah. So hopefully there'll be some folks asking questions we can we can touch base with them as well. Oh so. nice. Do you have any questions, or you just want me to, to dive in because you all look sheepish right now? It's like, well, I just, you get a few I minutes. like, no, I just let him breathe. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't give him a minute. No, my mind went blank. But I'm really here because I wanted to support you, Thank and you. I wanted to support this work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a whole lot of relationship experience. So can I ask you a question with what you just said? Please. What do you in in what depend what in what? I just went blank. <laughs> it's catching. In what, in what way do you mean support? Like the work that we're doing, what does that mean to you? What what is the work that he's doing that you want to support? Um, well, he's always talking about helping men. I guess this is more about helping women tonight. But I like the fact that you're helping men be more conscious and more aware of their feelings mm -hmm. and their emotions and yeah. how to communicate what they're feeling because that has actually been one of the biggest barriers between intimacy mm -hmm. of me and a man that I was truly interested in and wanted to be in a relationship with but he couldn't 
access that part of himself. And even if I tried to engage him and talk to him about it, it was still like this stone wall. And um, well, I mean, it can only last for a few months, right? Before <laughs> it's just like, okay, well, yeah. three months. I'm not getting anything. <laughs> and, the, and the sad thing is, I mean, and do you, I guess do you know the why of that? I generally or in his case. <laughs> in, in, well, in, yeah, generally speaking, in generally, yeah, um, that's a systemic case. That's actually a good point. Why don't you and tell I can me talk, the why? I can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, please tell me yeah, the Yeah, and, and this is a great thing. And so this actually ties in a lot to why I do the Mankind Project. One of the things that, one of the, like, the for me, the core things that's talked about is emotional literacy. There's like the five main emotions. There's mad, glad, sad, fear, anger, shame, guilt, right? These are like the things. So like most men know two of those, happiness and anger, right? And we are only really as men allowed to express those two emotions without sort of castration energetically, emotionally from society or our parents. And so, because it's like, dude, why cry, man? Buck up, be a man, you know? So it's just like, that's just built into us from society, you know, from the time we've been a kid, you know? Even, I mean, heck, it, it's sad, but like I've seen stories and I've seen videos of moms telling their little sons to like be a man. It's just like, he's a kid, mm -hmm. you know? And I've seen so many stories of like, you know, kids at the age of seven or five and their dad checks out and now, now all of a sudden this five or seven year old is the man of the house and now he has to drop his childhood, he has to drop all emotions and he needs to be able to enter the fold. So with that, men are not encouraged or supported like women are to have emotions. And women, from my perspective and assessment, are encouraged to express emotions, the, the, the full gambit of it, right? And they're supported by that. Whereas in men, it's like, you know, it's just like, you know, keeping the stiff upper lip, let's go play video games or baseball or let's fight or, you know, it's because it's we're trying to keep that masculine edge. So we haven't been... Sorry. No, I was saying we haven't been supported to do it, but that's why I'm doing this work is to educate people. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think, both of you, is the difference between men that are both, you know, raised this way, and then as adults, men that can really access this part, and then men that will not go there? What's the, what's right. the difference? Education. Then? Education. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 supporting community. Like it wasn't until I was in my late. 20s, early 30s, before I found in Ann Arbor a supporting community that actually encouraged men's emotional literacy. And I have a funny story that maybe you could laugh at. I was going to couples therapy with a woman I was dating a number of years ago, and the therapist was a friend. It was like a mutual friend, but she happened to be a therapist. And she goes, so Brian, how are you feeling about this? And I don't think I had gone through my men's training at that point, but I was just like, oh, I'm feeling really sad and frustrated about this. You know, and, and honestly, I'm, I'm angry about such and such. And she goes, whew, I was just like, what? She goes, most men I ask that question, do they go, oh, man, she's just being an F and B about this and blah, blah, blah. And he's like not using emotions. You know, men think, you know, what emotion am I feeling? It's, you know, she's being this or that or the other. It's not taking personal responsibility, yeah, projection. Mm -hmm. So in that, we've been tr conditioned since the time we came out of the womb to not feel emotions and not even know what the heck they are. This is a great time to just go ahead and cover nice guy syndrome. You know, one of the reasons I started the ministry was because of how powerful <clears throat> when I read No More Mr. Nice Guy, that book changed my life because it was basically written for me. Like the first example was named Jason. <laughs> so it's like this book is written for me. And what it's it's a it's it you know, it's just a systemic problem is it, it really is. It's a cultural problem. And it started a hundred plus years ago. Because when we went from an agrarian culture to an industrial culture, and the men started leaving the farms and started going into the factories, into the businesses, they left the homes, which meant they left the sons at home with their mothers. So the mothers did the best job they could raising their boys. And a lot of them, you know, as time went on, a lot more single mothers, a lot more divorce. So you have mothers playing these, these extra roles, trying to teach men or teach boys how to be men, but not being men. And then because we've lost a lot of the rite of passage that used to be part of actually becoming a man. We don't have any sort of rite of passage now. Maybe graduating high school, maybe college, maybe the military is, is something like that. But we've kind of lost a lot of that rite of passage. And so what's naturally happened is we as men have been trained to look to the feminine for our validation and for mm -hmm. our worth. And so 
it has over 50 to 100 years generated this nice guy which when you really get down to the core of the nice guy we're not really nice we're more manipulative and um, yeah I guess manipulative and and, and care, you know caretaking is a word for it but it's not it's unbalanced. Not unbalanced because we have lost that who am I as a man what is my purpose what is my core who am I as a man and I look to you as the feminine to validate me and tell me I'm good and, you know, whatnot. And so... Well, also, and that's something that Teal Swan mentions, too, is, like, there's this epidemic of, like, what you're talking about is that women are raising their sons to be safe men. So, in essence, they're emasculating them and not allowing, and not letting them grow up and to be the full, you know, container supporters that men are supposed to be. They're supposed to be the, the edge, the holding the container, for the women to be free and do what they need to do. But by this sort of emasculation on one of them, you know, one analogy or one word that exists in our culture is not cutting the cord, right? Mothers who don't cut the cord from the kid, these kids are very sort of like emasculated and they're wounded and they're, you know, like, what is it that you want me to do? I'll give you all my power so that you can be, love me and I can be happy. But like what woman wants to be like that, right? They want the man that's like, I got you, like I'm here. But unfortunately, like, I was raised in that sort of codependent, like, okay, if I don't take care of mommy, then she's going to be mad at me, and i got to acquiesce all my power to her. So, like, that's how I was raised. So I'm in the process of, like, standing up and becoming this, and it's an uh, uphill battle, and it's not easy because, unfortunately, there's – and then so there's that side, and then Jason mentioned the other side, which is the controlling, domineering a-hole, right, who women don't really want that either, but they feel more safe with him. Because they at least more feel attractive. more attractive, because they at least feel safe, on some sense, because they're not they know that he can protect her from the outside world, but she doesn't feel safe from him. So they, a lot of women will ping pong back and forth between the safe guy, which is like, oh, I love you, I'll buy you anything you want. What do you want? You know, and it's like women like that because it's better than that option. But after a while, it's like, okay, I'm bored. I'm gonna go right back to this other guy over here now. So right, so it's just this ping pong back and forth, and what. You know, there's a book that I actually recommended that I've read called um, Wild Attraction. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the energetics of things. Is that a question? Mm -hmm. It talks about the energetics of things and how the middle ground, like the enlightened male, is ideally what, what we're shooting for. But we have, we're living in this, and unfortunately there's not a lot of examples in pop culture or anything that is like what the ideal man should be. So there's, there's either the, the... Wild Attraction. What, yeah, wild attraction. I forget the authors. Um, so that's ultimately what we're looking for: is a man who is emotionally literate and safe, but also is protecting and you know can hold that container, right? So it's it's it's. Well, one of the things that is really interesting about this awareness and this work is seeing the influence it's had on women as well, because now we have this epidemic of nice guys, but now we also have an epidemic of the superwoman syndrome. Now, a lot of ladies feel like they have to be everything for everybody because the men have lost their ability to hold space. They've lost that, that grounding, you know, I'm here for you, I'm your rock, I'm going to hold space for you so you can be the divine feminine and flow. And, you know, a lot of single mothers, and then you got, you know, with the ladies going into business and owning their own business and like that, there's this thought process that naturally happens because most business has been masculine, that ladies adopt this masculine persona. And then wonder why it's hard to go home and immediately drop the masculine persona to be with a man when mm -hmm. you've been that all day long. Right. And then either he has to adapt mm -hmm. and get into his feminine so that there's a polarity, because without polarity there's no attraction, or he stays in his masculine, you stay in your masculine, then there's competition. Right. Because masculine and masculine is almost always competition. We're the hunters, we're the gatherers, we're the ones that go out to do that. You know, and so as a natural flow, being aware that if we're not in our masculine, you're not free to be in your feminine. And it has been just as unhealthy, if not more so, for a lot of ladies. Because running a high volume of masculine energy all day long isn't healthy for the feminine body. It causes a lot of stress. And, you know, the awareness begins the digging out. And on what Jason's saying, really wish I could remember it, but there was a really potent Teal Swan thing that she did. Like, it was just the camera on her, and she literally went to both those archetypes. Did either of you see that? I mean, that was 
potent, like super, super potent. I wish, and, and if I remember the name, I'll, I'll yeah. post it on this. But I mean, to watch her go through that, I mean, I was physically shaking watching her kind of drop into both of those. So, I mean, how did that land for you to, to see that? Um, I thought it was spot on. I mean, it was, you know, I think, you know, there's that, there's that dichotomy of, you know, wanting to be taken care of, but then also the expectation of having to do it all. Right. I mean, and I think, um, you know, for me, this was, it was interesting because I married a man who, um, was great, um, but couldn't provide. And then the expectation was that I was going to, you know, add to the family. I was going to carry a child. and right. But then I, I mean, I was going to have to do everything. And I didn't think it was fair. Um, it's interesting, uh, the concepts that I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if we're just merely evolving. Because there may just be an opportunity where, because the one, com- um, critique I guess I would have given Teal is well then just be all don't resist it just do it well, if you saw that was kind of her takeaway at the end uh-huh um at least that was my observation was she's like shh I can't I can't do this anymore like I can't live in either one of these anymore I need to find out what the middle yeah yeah and and I think that you know the 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 harsh masculine um character that she brought out was so upset that she had to do it all. But in my opinion, again, it's that resistance to doing it all. Like, yeah. I think we all can do it all. We just don't necessarily want to. But if we are in partnership with somebody who is also doing it all, we can work to, and then we can start to share resources and then we can start to like kind of meld. But I think it's a different construct mm-hmm. yeah. than previous relationships. It, it is, and I, and I think the answer to your question is yes, this does feel like an evolution. Because initially the whole purpose of marriage was a financial like obligation. It was a contract. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sell you my daughter to this man, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to get you know. It, it was it was about property. Mm-hmm. It wasn't about love. Mm-hmm. You know, and then they had and there was like a business. Okay, we're going to have kids together. We're like we're we're bosses. They're the employees, and we're going to have to like raise for the farm and all that. That whole story, like the agrarian culture, I think he was talking about. You know, it used to be a business negotiation. Now it's based in love, and so it's like that's evolved. Right. And so I don't. We don't know. It's happening in our lifetime right now. Like, right. how are we going to do this? Like, how are we going to? And it, the answer may not sadly come in our in our generation, but we're doing the work to like to get there. Well, yeah. that's that's the first part of the evolution. Because I mean, you look at if you go way back prior to you know five thousand years ago when we started this patriarchy. It was a matriarchy, right? Uh-huh. And then the men were like, at, at, you know, when that time frame ended and that evolution, then the men go, well, we're the bigger, stronger. Why shouldn't we be in charge? Right. And now we've gone through this patriarchy, basically ran it into the ground as far as we could go, and we're starting to learn that there is a better way on both sides. Which, like you're talking about, there's an evolution of, the, I think, the awareness of the uh, old paradigm of masculine, the old paradigm of feminine, the newer paradigms of nice guy and superwoman. And then dropping all of that and being more present in what is needed right now. You know, what does love call for right now? What's needed in the moment? And it's a lot of the personal development work that I've done and and, and, in in the awareness of it is you learn your basic safe safety like personality type. Like for me, I'm a supporter. I get stressed out, I go back to supporting. I, I, I become aloof, I back off. Somebody else may be, you know, more of an interrogator or a controller. But learning that just because that may be our safe zone, we have the capacity for all personality types. We have the capacity for all those different things and to be aware in the moment, which is necessary. So um, if it's okay, I mean. Please. No, this is fantastic. Because I I have like all these internal theories and, you know, so um, one of the things that's of interest too, and this also occurs, um, you can look up. Wikipedia actually has a really great um, description of um, uh, generations. And essentially generations also we exhibit a similar pattern. Yeah. So as you're talking about the patriarchal versus mm-hmm. the, the matriarchal, right, and the pendulum swings, mm-hmm. I do believe that perhaps what has gone on is the pendulum, you know, mm-hmm. went from there and it's, it's swinging back here and it's then now it's going to swing back. Yeah. 
I don't think we will ever hit the stasis in the middle where we will always be like, you know, in, you know, complete, we're all going to be the same. Because if we did do that, there would be no energy and we would be basically, that's the only, cease to exist, essentially. So I think with this, like, pendulum, I think is of yep. interest that it may swing and we're just in the middle, like, we're, yep. like, going to, now we're kind of come well, back. I, I, I just want to say, I agree with you. Yeah. And that's the model that I've been aware of. And, yeah, I definitely feel like it's it's swinging back. And, you know, just from a lot of how I try to teach people is going to the, from a science level. If some organism is struggling on death, it's going to find energy to fight harder. And that's what we're seeing right now. And when we look at the political system, I mean, you're having white men, Anglo-Saxon men that are fighting stronger and harder and their beliefs are getting because they know they're losing the battle. So they're kicking and screaming harder and faster to try to pre prevent the inevitable that's happening. Mm -hmm. That's my perspective. I don't want to touch Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, well, and if you go... So go ahead. Was there another thought after that? Or unless... Well, let me... Yeah, sure. There's a... Uh, if you look at tribal traditions, and, and they were big into astrology and astronomy, and they knew the procession of the equinoxes, they knew the procession of the stars, and they knew about the great year long before... The great you know, year. The great year, which is a 26,000-year yeah. cycle where we go through the you know five different signs of the equinox. And one of the things that's really interesting, when you look at through ancient religions, a lot of the ages that these religions be either started or became popular, were like now we're in the age of Pisces. And we're moving into the Aquar age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. yeah. We are in the Aquarian age. It, or something like that. The calendars. Depending on... Depending on... Within each great year, there's this... 13, there's two 13,000 year cycles, and there's an 11,000 year cycle, then there's this 2,000 year uh, time frame where we actually enter what's called like the photon band, which is this you know, acceleration, which we're in, we've been entering since 87, and each year we're more and more into it, and it's part of the more energy coming into the planet. Exactly. It's called the um, photon band, or photon belts, depending on you know, with your resource, but okay. it's, and what's interesting about it is there's getting, you know, going back to the science, if you look at fossil records, you know, go back, say, to, like, shellfish and bony fish, there wasn't ever really a half shellfish, half bony fish in evolution. There seemed to be this very short window of time where all of a sudden shellfish turned into bony fish and so on. Just mm -hmm. like with even our evolution or, you know, the evolution of other species, there's this, what seems like in archaeological records, this very short period of time where there's this leap in evolution. And it seemed to coincide, when, especially if you look at, like, the ice core drillings from, Antarctica and stuff where they can go back 144,000 years and see, you know, the CO2 levels and different things. Around about every 11,000 years or so, there's this increase in in evolution, energy, I think it's you know, even CO2 and, and mm -hmm. carbon dioxide or and oxygen mm -hmm. levels. There's this influx. And so we're moving into that now, and it kind of goes into your cycle. It's almost like we're coming back into the, the center point where there's that we're going to find balance, we're going to find harmony, we're going to have this consciousness you know evolution and then once we're through this cycle we're going back into the next phase which uh, a lot of the ancient tradition have called the, the great night the call you go you know mm -hmm. so and that's goes into what you're saying we're, about, yeah, we're in the call you go yeah. yeah we're never gonna find that stasis point because life's not about stasis but mm -hmm. they're we're moving into this you know evolution of consciousness and so all these conversations about divine masculine divine feminine bringing awareness to our own spirituality our own beingness of I'm a spiritual being in a, in a human body so I'm this dichotomy of eternal spiritualness in a finite physical form and it's the this and that you know philosophy that it's not one or the other but both yeah the yeah, both yeah, and. yeah the both and yeah, I do this and that he does both and same thing same thing so. but yeah I know th that I mean I've heard different ideas but yeah that 26,000 mm -hmm. year cycle it's it, it's potent so if you want to look that up there's a lot of information we glean from that yeah, you know, Barbara Barbara Hanclow and Barbara Marciniak, Bringers of the Dawn, uh, books like uh, that are I I have one of the books I they're they're yet. huge. Um, I think it was Bringers of the Dawn, or might have been Mayan Code. But I think Spirit Science talks about yeah, it too. Yeah, that's well, why I mean, tribal traditions. You yeah. look at the Aborigines, Native Americans, and all these tribal tradi uh, cultures. They've been talking about this, and we're just now, as educated Westerners, going. It exists. Yeah, which is funny. Oh my god. Um, listen, listen to them. We got this new thing. It's called earthing. Yeah. You walk around barefoot. It's really good for your body. 
we just invented it. Well, it's like metaphysics. You know, science is finally catching up to what spiritual tradition has been saying for thousands and thousands of years. Science is finally going, oh, mm -hmm. there might actually be something <laughs> to this whole energy thing yeah. and, you know, there being a, a, a divine matrix and a field that we exist in, a zero-point field. You know, they're just now getting to that point. It was even a holographic theory. Yeah. yeah. Like the holographic universe. It's, we're just now getting to that point where it's like, oh, well, we'll believe science because it's vetted. So... <laughs> Ladies. It's empirical. It must so, be true. So this is my biggest problem with communication with men. Okay. Is it gets way too intellectual. Ah. So I'm sitting here for like the last ten minutes. I'm just feeling, 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 feeling that it's missing the mark mm -hmm. because the masculine is the intellectual, the analytical. And unless it's resting on the feminine part mm -hmm. and we're actually like feeling instead of analyzing and getting too intellectual, right. then you're not creating that balance and that unity within your own being, mm. which is what I've been practicing and what I teach in meditation. And that's what I find is like, I'm just resting in the, the feminine heart and I'm feeling and I'm experiencing and I'm emanating and I'm trying to share. And the man's getting too intellectual. He's throwing all this mm. blah, 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 yuga, 26-year <laughs> cycle, I'm blah, 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 belt, you know? I'm and I'm, I'm like, okay, but you're feeding my mind, mm. but it's not connecting here. And so that's like, I don't know. It's Thank it's, you. Yeah. First off, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah, you thank for you. listening. Absolutely. Well, and that, yeah. that, that's exactly Because it's that my biggest, point. like, I'm like, inside you know when I'm like in relationship with men I'm like dying inside and I try and talk to them a million times about how I'm feeling you're the first two who are actually like paying attention <laughs> <laughs> so thanks well and that's part of the no of the, don't do yeah. that <laughs> no, Please. No, just for now yeah, no. just for, for now that, I'm gonna go back into my heart that's part of the reason we do the work we do is because we, we found that to be true we don't connect and so learning to as the masculine to hold space and that's what you're asking for is that actual presence and attention exactly to yeah. hold space and to connect yes because and like lost the last that. yeah 15 minutes i lost my connection mm -hmm. i lost a little bit and as now, well i think going back and forth with you know just all of the information yeah. sure i think like i really resonate with what you said about the pendulum and how i kind of see it more as like like um finding that balance of masculine and feminine in in each of us right sure. and like i noticed personally like my experience dating men in the past like you shared brian i either dated the really um pushover guys that were really sweet or the really strong military mm -hmm. guy mm -hmm. guys and i noticed like once i did the work of really incorporating because like i have a business side that's really masculine and really driven and then i also have a really spiritual side i'm a reiki master teacher and i just love people and nowadays I've learned how to like incorporate both and I see what's showing up in my world is really as you called like um, just more more embodied more embodied men that are doing this work that show up and can can be the strong man and hold the space and can also talk about the feelings right. and so I think the key is just really for all of us men and women to really incorporate a balance between both of our energies and that comes from awareness um, so when you talked about the cords in the back um, what I got from everything I've learned about Reiki is that um, the back is really like past lifetimes deep childhood wounds ancestral parental um, so a lot of that I think how to break the gap is really having having awareness and choosing choosing to um, have awareness around yeah. it and then and then shift yeah well, that's the beginning of everything. You always have to have the awareness, and I think that's what we're lacking. We're lacking an awareness of why men are either hyper masculine and can only give you that polarized, you know, like, oh, you're, you, I feel physically safe with you, but you don't feed my soul. Or the nice guy who you're not sexually attracted to because there's almost no polarization. You can share all your feelings. You can share all your feelings with him, and then he becomes your friend and your girlfriend, but there's no. You know, there's no way to create that polarization, which is mm -hmm. totally necessary for sexual attraction. But then the same thing with the ladies becoming more more into business and being more masculine and feeling like you have to do it all. Yeah. We're all both out of balance. We're both out of whack. And so coming yeah. together and having these conversations about how do we connect at the heart and how do we get an actual connection going and, and, and finding that balance. 
And here's a fairness, like, in your observation of that is, so both my parents are very masculine. <laughs> like, um, and so I have been programmed to hit that intellectual. And, my, and so, like, intellectually speaking, I can go very, very deep. And so that's, I know I was feeding you guys because mm. I was getting fed off the same conversation, but you guys were not. Oh, no, there was a yeah. definite. You know? Can I just say, that's an interesting, it's like, look, there's an aisle, there's two women that are more feminine, you know, and then, and then you know, so it's interesting how you chose to even sit. Yeah. And because it, they're and like, I have no idea what just happened. Like, yeah, like, I mean, I'm from corporate America, too. Right. And so I'm actually excited to well, go back into corporate America. Yeah, and, and I'm, to your point of, I'm, I'm super, because I took the time out mm-hmm. to like, one, I thought I was going to start a business and not necessarily evolve the way I did, mm-hmm. but um, the, going back in, I'm very curious about bringing both sides, because I have, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, I talked earlier, like my heart is hurt, like it is, I think it is opening and I am shifting things, but you can tell like I'm still stuck up here, mm-hmm. but I think my interactions are going to be so different. I, both sides. Yeah, just a little tidbit. I, I quit my corporate career of 10 years and I've launched out doing my own thing. And I found this amazing startup that I'm working with and I'm leading the entire sales department. Very yes. masculine. And it, I'm going to sales. And it was and it yes. was to all men. So I had I proposed our first sales meeting on Friday. I baked pumpkin chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I like felt really in my feminine. I wore a dress. I wore cute heels. I brought cookies. I dropped into my heart space. And then I was like, all right, guys, this is our plan for sales. And so it was such a good balance mm. for me because I like being feminine. I love baking cookies. And it, and it was just such a beautiful, beautiful flow yeah. like of bringing like, it both. Can I ask, how was that received? Yeah. It was received amazing. Good. So that actually brings up a, my next point. What it, I was actually going to ask you. Would you guess it would not be a I, I was open because it could go either way. It could be a train wreck or it could have been welcomed great. And so I'm glad that it was the latter. Yeah. What? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think when we meet people in our heart space, when we're authentic, when we're genuine, when we're real with who we are, and we have that balance. Like I think for me, I went in knowing that leading a sales department, I mean, numbers driven, motivated, yes, yeah. mm-hmm. and so I mixed it in with like my authentic heart space, and yeah, it, it was it went amazing. Well, and that's something I wanted to bring up because I actually want to throw out to get your opinions because what one of the things I it was kind of epiphany that hit me one day was if we actually fall into our harmony as masculine and feminine, the masculine is naturally going to caretake, mm-hmm. is going to take mm-hmm. care of the feminine. So adopting a masculine personality in business may be hindering actually success in business for the ladies. If you can come from mm-hmm. a divine yeah. feminine heart totally. space and just own it as this is who I am, then there's this natural inclination for the men to want to take care of you and to, to do it. So it's, you could almost lead better from a, Totally. You know, like a divine, strong, feminine heart space, because it just it just brings that masculine side out of us. It's like the same thing. I had a friend who I was in a class with that was had you know owned her own business for twenty years, was very much in her masculine, very much corporate America, and had a hard time accepting help from anybody. Like she had a broken wrist, was going on a plane, and couldn't lift her bag up. And the guy, just being a gentleman, said, "Can I help you with your bag?" And her initial reaction was, "No, I can do it." Until finally, she's like, "Oh well, maybe I can't do it." And then he helped her with her bag. He felt good as a man because I served the feminine. I, I, I was a gentleman. But then she felt that she owed him something or that mm-hmm. there was something to give. But there's not because you just both fulfilled your function. We feel so empowered by being able to be the masculine and caretake and, and provide for. And by attempting to draw out that divine super feminine from that heart space, you may naturally bring out that side of the masculine. Of course, granted, because there's so many people who aren't aware about whether they're in their hyper-masculine or they're in nice guy syndrome or whatever, they may not understand what you're doing. It may take practice. But that natural pulling out, and to talk about nice guy syndrome, one of the reasons it's such a detriment, nice guys don't feel like men because they have emotions. And they've been trying to stuff their emotions as you can. And they've been fed this, which isn't just men. Ladies have been fed it as well, that this is what a man is. John Wayne, stiff, stoic upper lip, I don't need help. I don't have any emotions. The only emotions I'm allowed to have are I can be, I can smile at you and I can yell at you. I can 
be happy, happy, happy. And then... Or there's Don Juan, who or Don seduce Juan, yeah. you in the yeah. very, very easy, you know. So, you know, one of the big things that nice guys, or the nice guy syndrome in general, teaches guys is that they're not men. And then, because it's been so prevalent, the ladies have also, you know, they, they start to, to predicate that as well. Like, oh, well, this is, suck it up, be a man. And there's a lot of guys that, uh, Brene Brown's work is amazing on shame because mm -hmm. there's, especially men, women, and worthiness by Brene Brown is, is was eye-opening for me because not realizing, I thought it was just men doing it to men. But, oh, but the guy oh. was, you know, the, the best example was this husband asked <laughs> her why did she didn't work for, for, with men. She goes, oh, I just don't. I work with women. He's like, well, that's convenient. And she's like, okay, why? He's like, well, my wife and three daughters would rather see me die on top of my white horse, never fall off and be bummed. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, where the awareness comes in. We need to be aware that we both need to support each other and be vulnerable. You know, and be able to, <laughs> thank you, and be, be able to hold space for each other. And it's, you know, it's, and it's a different space holding. You know, I want to bring up that conversation we had about why it takes longer for men to fall into love and to fall out of love. Why it seems to us, especially as men, why women can be totally in love with you, then you break up, and two the days to a week later, the next day, done. <clears throat> it's actually really interesting. Um, I actually thought that men fell much harder and faster than women. That's how, how I perceive it. We're speaking it. stereotypically on this. Yeah, and that's that's the whole thing. Everything that we're touching on is right. a generalization because right. it, it, it's true for everybody, but it's not 100% true for anybody. And, and interestingly speaking, I mean, from my upbringing, you know, maybe that's like well, my program, there's a right? question too. Here. I'll so. raise my hand. I have a tendency of falling fast. But on the, on the flip side, I need six months at least yeah, to really get perfect. clear on my heart before I can interact with well, them. Yeah, on, this is a good thing to discuss on, too. on a friend level. And, and, I've, and I'm seeing this. In fact, it's I, I was literally having a conversation with a colleague the, the other day who had been married to this man for like 18 years. And she was like, yeah, we're going to, you know, it was a mutual, mutual separation. And um, she was like, yeah, I wanted to go out and have beers with him and have, be friends with him. I'm like, hang on. A after the, was it, I wanted to go out and have beers and be friends with him right after we signed our divorce papers. And I was just like, hang on. From a man's standpoint, it's like, okay, we're getting divorced. We've been together for 18 years. Now you want me to go be your friend and have beers with you? Like that, my um, a man just goes blah at that point. And so like, but for her, I mean, granted, the separation never starts from the point of divorce, right? It's, it's always leading up to it. But in my experience, men need like a, a good three to six months after any sort of deep, intimate relationship to really kind of come out of that. I do. Yeah. I'll speak for myself. And there's a lot of men that are like that. And then it was just interesting to me, and, and we both agreed on this, that I've seen a lot of women that, like, wanted to be friends two days later. So it's like, hold the phone. Like, what, what, what about what we just, you know. And so I've experienced that personally, and I've heard that from women, how they can just flip on a switch. And it's just, it is interesting. So you, you have a pending question, it looks like. No, it's just, uh, so I came across an article that supports what you're saying, and I'll see if I can right. find it and, like, send it to you, but it's, like, a brain, it's a it's a programming, like, it's an actual well, brain development. Uh, sure. Where well, it does take a little, lot longer for the man yeah. to, like... It's, it's, it's the masculine-feminine dynamic of the feminine being is, more emotional and being more okay to be emotional, so you're allowed to be oh, emotional. You're, you're, there's more of a support system, and, uh -huh. and just because of the difference in our how our brains work because mm -hmm. there's a great video on YouTube that I love where this guy talks about here's a man's brain it's all these nice little neat boxes and stuff goes in its appropriate box <laughs> and the biggest box and then man's favorite box is the nothing box right in the middle and so when you ask a man what are you thinking he says nothing he's in his nothing box because he's really not thinking anything but then you look at the woman's brain and it looks like one of those old uh, switchboard AT&T with all the wires, or maybe one of those <laughs> one of those bulletin boards where you know they're doing the, the crime show and they switchboard, you know the switchboard. But then even you know the, the crime show bulletin boards that put up all the pictures and they oh, put the all the yarn and everything, the strings everywhere. It's like that. Everything's connected to everything, and so that's why we make that you know confused dog face when we ask you a question about one thing and you answer something else. You go, huh? We don't understand how those two are connected, but you get it. And it's kind of the same with that. Just the natural feminine 
you know, comfort with emotion, being able to emote and clear. And so the analogy that was inspired that came through me was women are more like the boat in the sea. They go with the tide. They kind of float around and whatnot. And men are more like the train on the track. It takes us a while to get going, but we're very linear. And once we get going, we're going. And then there's no quick change. It may seem like it sometimes. And, of course, this is a very big generalization. But once we get going, and then you want to go, okay, well, now we're not together anymore. We can't just turn the corner. We've got to slow down, back up, change tracks, and right. go in that direction. So it takes a while. So I want to pause there. How is that landing? Is that making sense? Yeah. Especially, especially for you two, I know we can be analytical all day long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to see, especially for the women watching, like, how is that landing from like more of an emotional, heart-centered? I feel, um, or do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead. I'm still feeling. She's processing. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to take notes, but I think um, I really... <laughs> this is not a good spot. <laughs> Arm rest. Arm rest. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was really great, and I really resonate with the, you know, switchboard and then mm -hmm. the compartmentalizing. I do notice that the more that I'm not conscious and aware, I'm like the switchboard. The more I meditate, the more I do the work, I can definitely compartmentalize in a healthy mm -hmm. way, like focus on the task at hand. And I didn't realize until recently, um, I went, I was working with a brain doctor, and he, he shared that I have a borderline ADHD. And I had never been diagnosed. And I feel just the more I do this work, I can really focus on the task at hand and like really be present and not be thinking anything. It's more like when I'm not conscious of it, that's when all the stuff is intermingled. Um, and then as far as when someone gets out of a, health, of a relationship, I think all humans that are healthy and conscious need time. Mm -hmm. All of them. Because if, if you don't, then you're bringing your stuff into the next part. So if you haven't had time, men or women, if you haven't had time to heal, let go, release, then you're just pulling it in. Whether you say you're over it or not, it depends how long you were with, how emotionally invested. But it, but I think the generalizations are somewhat true. But yeah. I think, um, yeah, just it, it, it requires, you know, just a lot of, um, you know, they say feeling the feelings. Mm -hmm whatever's happening, feeling it, so you can have awareness, you can feel it, then you can move past, you can transcend. Right. So. And, and I'll just say from my, uh, this is my own story, I have, Jason and I are, are, are at least currently different in this situation where <laughs> I, I have been on a chain of constantly dating for the last five, six, seven years um, with very little time in between. And now in this place of singledom and clarity, even, even within the last year or so, I've come to this awareness where, like you're saying, time to kind of pause, integrate, reflect, let go. I've been patching one wounded heart with another one, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so eventually over time, they kind of do get healed as they would naturally. But I own that I'm, quote, in, in some sense, numbing out by getting involved in another relationship to help me feel those happy, warm, fuzzy feelings again that prevent me from feeling the shitty, oh my God, I just broke up and now I'm single and my life is over. So I own that, that was something, that was an unconscious thing that I was doing at the time. Um, but I can sit here in this moment of clarity, especially with the, the, the conversation I've been having with my most recent um, partner and going, oh, no, no, actually, no, I need, I need this space and I don't want any, I mean like, we can talk and we can be friends on the phone, but I, I really need like the physical proximity in that space to really get clear in my own mind for what I want, you know. Um, so this is just coming to me. It may be a tangent, but I think it fits in somehow. What you're saying about conscious people taking space, um, I think shamanistic came up in the conversation between one of you or both of you. Like a true shaman, what they actually do, they go and spend time in the woods for years to just be alone and really get clear on who they are and what they're offering without the influence of everyone else. Even like in the Buddhist traditions, like monks will either go out and they're gone or they go out for a number of years and they come back with a clear mind and they teach that perspective of what they've learned and that kind of thing. So there's those two different, there's names that I don't remember right now, but in that sort of sense, like that's kind of reminding me of what you just said of like, 
yeah, I just need to get clearer. Like, what are my needs in my relationships? Maybe this last one informed me on all the things that I do need that I wasn't getting, or holy cow, I really don't want that going into the next relationship. So yeah, and that goes, you know, being opposite of him, I've kind of created my own rite of passage for the last five years because I had these three, four relationships, like boom, 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 back to back, and they've been girlfriends and everything, and then none of them worked because. I was an awful boyfriend, and I was uneducated. And so it was like, okay, well, I'm obviously the common denominator. So let me <laughs> educate myself. And so I've basically taken the last five years pretty much off. No real dating, you know, with a couple dates here and there, but really just to work on me. And that's where a lot of this work has come from, because I've studied so much because I don't want to do that again. I don't want to have these relationships where there's no communication, there's no connection. It's the hard work line for yeah. me. Yeah. It's the so I learned it by doing it. <laughs> we learned it by studying. So we balanced, we came to the same point, oddly enough, but like I did it through like. I, I did it. I just did it wrong for so long. Well, there's no right or wrong. Stop. <laughs> so and that's, so it's, that brings up a conversation. Is that a question? I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Do we need intimacy in relationship? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We need of course intimacy. We need intimacy. So, but the question that I was going to say was, is gone now. Yeah. Well, since, <laughs> since Kirk brought it up, oh, go ahead. Oh, can I offer one? Yeah. Um, the concept of, um, I, I would offer to, and I think that this is kind of the issue that is going on where men are feeling like they're being bombarded with it's their fault, but mm. it's not. And it, and it, and it's, and it is a collective mm. because, um, one of the things I like to do when I talk with people is like, if you really want to understand like Donald Trump, find a picture of his mom. <laughs> Dead serious. You will look at his mom. I mean, if you guys Googled that, you would know exactly what I'm talking about. She looks like the most horrendous like person to ever be like in face with. So like you can tell that that was years and years and years of abuse right. and programming that created who we have right now. Right. So, and I'm not saying like, you know, your parents are like that, but it is like this like collective, like, so don't, I wouldn't, I would suggest that when you talk about you, you being the common denominator, yes, but also if you are healed, you would make different choices and you wouldn't yeah. pick the women that you had been right, with before right. because they too yeah. had their in, own issues. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It takes two to tango. It sure. absolutely does. And that's the whole thing too. I mean, you bring up a great point about not blaming or, you know, mm -hmm. trying to say it's so-and-so's so fault. It's not. It's collective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the whole point of doing this work is to bring awareness to it so we can go, okay, what, what is my role? Uh -huh. Where is my responsibility? How much of my responsibility do I take in this intimate relationship? How much, you know, to, to speak to the, the last guy, you know, am I shut down here? Can I open up and connect? And what's the fear of blocking us? And for most of us men, it's because we've been told all of our lives, don't be a pussy, be a man. Lock it down, mm -hmm. and you wonder why men usually die before women, why we don't live as long. We shove all this down. And this and and alcoholism and yeah. abuse, drugs, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the, the having the awareness and having the ability to for us men to hold space and for the women to hold space for us and to acknowledge that we have emotions, and even acknowledge, you know, your own training as women that I'm not I, I've never dealt with a man that's actually got emotions. I'm not. I don't even know what that looks like. I need you to be strong, and, you know, be that bride or caretaker. Right. Well, and that—that's the that. And so, speaking, having done this work for years with organizations, men are in this, and, and it's equal but opposite. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. Mm -hmm. Because like that, like that. I mean, that's an amazing example of it in the Brene Brown book, Daring mm -hmm. Greatly. This old man walks up. He's like. You want me to be vulnerable, but my parent, my kids, my daughter, my wife want me to be the white knight up on top of the mountain, stone face. But yet, there is like this. The flip side is you want us to be emotional. You want us to share our emotions, but the second we do, we're perceived as weak, and then we're not desirable anymore. And I'm speaking extremes here, but I've been caught in that, you know. And so something I want to reference, and there's two things. One, um, Yogi Bhajan teaches um, kundalini yoga he's like the founder of kundalini yoga i was actually speaking with two friends of mine who actually are one is an active practicing sikh and has they both studied under him um, there are these deep within the hinduistic religions or something sikhism are manifestos like these are the seven things that men and women need to follow 
And it goes back like generations, millennia. It's like these are the seven things they need to do. And one of the core things that I heard that just smacked me between the eyes was women need to take their issues to women. Men need to take their issues to men. And so if I'm in a relationship with you and I'm confiding in you and all the shame and vulnerability and stuff that I have that most conscious relationships want to have, now on some subconscious level I'm be, being perceived as weak because now I need to cry my heart out to you about how I was abused and all these things, but then I'm going to go back and fix the house and be the man and keep the stiff upper lip, right. right? And so it's kind of these both and, and it's really hard for us to hold both sides, like the teal swan thing. You want us to be the emotional, the, the, the feminine energy in the emotional side, but then, you know, two seconds later, you need us to be the man and keep that lip and protect the container so that you can be safe to do what you need to do. And so we kind of also have a similar thing that we're dealing with, too. The thing that I want to just kind of come together with this, and this is like a segue, and then I'll pause for questions, is we're both right. In an argument, we're both right. I'm right, you're right, based on my stories, beliefs, and history, and you're right based on your stories, beliefs, and history. And the idea isn't for us to come together and convert the other one of us to the to who is right or wrong. It's like, hey, we both have this. Let's just put our cards out. Like, what? Where are we not lining up? You know, this is my story. So this is actually a tool that I did with my last um, partner, and it was really profound. I held her at bay for six years because I had this story that I was creating. Finally, I walked up to her and I said, "Look, I've been creating the story that these are the these are projections of what I perceive you to be." And I've been keeping you at bay. And finally, for the first time ever, I'm going to own at least half of those. But I really want to know what's behind that. And she and she kind of looked at me like dumbfounded. You know, that was her first date. Like, I perceive you to be all these negative things. I'm removing those projections off of you. And I just want to know what your reality is. And she's like, wow. She's like, thank you for being vulnerable and honest with me about why you haven't connected. All those things you just told me are all my shadow perspectives and you're not the first person to tell me. And oh my God, thank you for owning your own stuff in that, right? And she's like, and and by the way, did you still want to stay for dinner and didn't have this day? I'm like, oh, absolutely. And she's like, oh good, because she thought I was coming to just like drop the bomb and kind of walk out sort of thing. So that was like how we started our relationship on that deep vulnerable place. But I was wrong in some of those projections. Some of them were my own stories. So like I was like, hey, I'm having this experience, and is it true or not true? Because I want to know, like, are these stories in my head about this experience true? Or are they not? And if they're not, please let me know. And I think that's something that we can both do because a lot of <laughs> – we can only see ourselves in a mirror. Right? I can only see myself in a mirror. You can only see yourself in a mirror. So I'm seeing a lot of my negative traits or positive traits in you and you and you and you. And so sometimes the mirror is dirty and I see all my negative stuff in you. And I got to just own that. And that's really deep work. That's that's this work, right? And so, I come, yeah, I to... so, so but with that, how does that land? Like the, the kind of like the owning, like we're both right. So let's come to the table and let's talk about where the miscommunication is and how can we at least understand the other side. We don't necessarily need to acquiesce, but just like, hey, how can we come together? Go ahead. <laughs> I feel like my brain's going. That was a lot again. Somewhere okay. else. No, no, it's just going, <laughs> it's going somewhere else. Yes, please. I'm getting clarity about my last relationship, and it was something that you had said about when I say I want to connect with you, I want you to share with me. I'm not saying I want you to be emotional. Mm -hmm. To me, if you're emoting, that's your stuff, that's your shadow work. Sure. You don't need to dump that on me. You need to go meditate, take care of what you got to take care of, bring yourself back into balance. What I'm talking about is the essence of the feminine and the heart, which to me, they're all those amazing childlike qualities where you're not intellectual, you're not in the mind thinking, the ego's not taking over, you're in the body, you're feeling, not having emotions, but just feeling, and able, what I wanted from him is for him to express his exuberance, his creativity, mm -hmm. his, um, what is, just all of those childlike qualities that allows me to feel connected deeply to somebody, and to be in the play 
and to feel like we are interacting in the way that I want us to. And I know it was like the deepest way we possibly could. And the intimacy and the sensuality and the tantra and all of that, like on top of all of that, the creativity, the play. So it's not about like, I need you to be emotional. Are you feeling shame? Tell me you're feeling shame. Stop hiding. And it's like, no, get out of your mind. Mm -hmm. Get out of your, Mm -hmm. your ego, your intellect, and just let yourself be in the heart and be childlike and let's well, play that, off of each other and that that's goes, what I really wanted from him yeah and that goes right back to the exact same thing we were talking about that that's what we as men have been trained out of yeah and Women so we've been, we've been trained yeah. to, to keep it above like this this little 18 yeah. inch gap I mean we've built up all these layers and so even though you want him to be creative and be in his body and, and do those things that feels like the most vulnerable place for him because he has to go through all these very emotions mm-hmm. and layers to get there. And that's why it takes work and awareness <clears throat> to dig out your own stuff. And so, like, to his point, men should go to men for the deep triage work because men can understand men and we can support each other there. Mm-hmm. As far as, you know, emergencies, yeah. Yes. In relationships, yeah, yeah if you're having a day sure. and he comes home or you come home, you can support each other in that day or in that moment. Mm-hmm. But if it's deep work needs to be happening, that's when you're like, okay, I need you to go to your men's group. I need you to go see, or if you're having anything, it's like, I need you to go see your lady. Mm -hmm. Because we heal each other in that that way. So can I just offer just uh, an example for you? So this, we offer Mankind Project runs a 48-hour intensive. Somewhere in the middle, in, in the first third of it, we do this experience where we lead men on a guided visual imagery to touch into their inner child. I, and I would say in my experience over the last four years in the 12 staffings that I've done, at least half of the room of men are in inconsolable tears by the time they come out of that visualization of tapping in with their inner child for the first time and going, I love this thing. So just let that sit for a second. That's amazing. So, because that's how deep it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't start. Yeah. You know, people think, oh, this starts like as a teenager. No, it starts yeah. four, five, six. In my experience, I was a very empathic, emotional child. I cried all the time. And it wasn't until around 12 I had a traumatic experience and I shut it down. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't cry again until 21, probably something like that. Like, I would not emote in that way. Because I had completely shut it off. Yeah. And then it's this process when you actually decide to be conscious and to get to that place of I want to open my heart. There's this process. You have to go through layer by layer by layer. And when people say we're onions, mm-hmm. they're so right. Because I've actually done breath work with, with some um, mm-hmm. practitioners where they would talk me down to the first layer. And I would fall inconsolably and then get to this layer of peace mm-hmm. for a little bit. And then hit the next layer, right. and fall inconsolably, and, it, and it's this process, and you know, unless you, you has already done the work. By the way, I had to do all this work too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Oh, absolutely. It's not like I absolutely. just I'm all of a sudden like tapped into my pure <laughs> essence, yeah, yeah. and it's like I'm childlike, and no, I was trained to be masculine, right. so yeah. I had to do all of that work, and it's a constant, yeah, minute by minute thing of being present, being in my body, you know, and the practice of it. Oh, absolutely. No, I honor and acknowledge that women have equal in, in their own work to do in their, in their own. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Actually, there's a sister organization called Women Within from Mankind, and there's other as well, but Women Within is a sister organization to the Mankind Project. Um, and I just want to touch on what she, um, who is this? Oh, Kirk, Kirk actually. Yeah. This is, I think the women wants her man to be wholly present and vulnerable without dumping his baggage on her to carry or making her yeah. feel unsafe. And that's true. So it's like we're not here just like dump this bag of, you know, 10 year old trash in your lap. That's not, yeah, that's, that, that's not what we're kind of speaking about being the emotional part. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, the, it's that fine line within that. But that's what? absolutely true. Thank you, Kirk. Yeah. yeah and there's, a, there's the other point too where they're, Need there, we both need to be able to hold space for each other, like in those emergency moments, in those times where, and that's where the vulnerability and the, and the safety comes in. Because if you're in a relationship and he knows that, or he doesn't feel safe to get to that place, then you're not, he's not going to be able to be open and. Well, that's a both and. And it's, and it's both ways, and that's yeah. the other thing too. The, what you just touched on is it's so true, and that's really an awareness that we all want to have that 
women have been over-masculinized, men have been over-feminized, and now we're both relearning what it means to be masculine, what it means to be feminine, and we're going through that work, and then trying to find that balance In the together. Yeah, yeah that difference, or even, even in relationships. No, see, as it's swinging, yeah. it's shifting. Right? Yeah. Right. And, and so we're all doing some kind cool. of deep inner work to find out who we really are to get to our inner children. Yeah, similar to what you were saying, the extremes of, you know, being overly emotional and, you know, how we want both, women want both the emotional and the strong warrior. I feel like similarly with, like with us, you know, the the emerging of the businesswoman, the woman that does it all. She takes care of the family, she bakes, she cooks, she, takes, she cleans, and she has the, you know, job. So I feel like, too, for us, you know, you want a confident woman who can, you know, lead the family, take care of the family, but also is feminine and sexy mm -hmm. and playful and spiritual. So I think, you know, similarly, we both have it. And I, I want to touch upon a relationship I had with a man who was like 20 years older, and it was phenomenal. And we didn't work out because we were in different phases of life. He had grown children. I'm super hungry and want to have children. But it worked because he was so, like, like I'm reflecting on this. Like, we could talk about anything. So it wasn't like when he would share deep stuff with me, I, I did not get turned off by that. I, I was actually turned on by his vulnerability <laughs> or sharing his emotions about his past stuff and being so authentic with where he was. And then in the same, you know, again, it was just like the work that we're all doing to be whole incorporate our masculine and our feminine and he had done you know he was much older so he had a lot of sure. experience doing this he was you know strong he was confident he played soccer three days a week he was successful he was spiritual he could talk about his feelings he was very embodied and and it was so beautiful that would be an example of the enlightened male the the one that sits in the middle that's an example yeah. of that, and unfortunately, I was saying that there's a it's a few and far between that exist in this world, but that's what we're ideally trying yeah, to shoot I, for. Yeah, I think that's the goal of life yeah. for all yeah. of us yeah. is yeah. to really incorporate our masculine and our feminine, and like what how we've been talking about our past relationships. I don't think not putting my phone there. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I don't think any of us have done anything wrong. You know, like I've like I think every relationship we've had has assisted us in learning more about ourselves, mm -hmm. healing more within ourselves, so we can come to that closer space right. of being yeah. more well, whole. I, I think I share this with both of you, but for me, the way that I've kind of cognized this, a few messages mm -hmm. now, there's a few ways that I've cognized this. Is it's hey, Kirk. Hey, Kirk. Cool. <laughs> so um, the way that I've kind of cognized this, <laughs> and I'm not a video game person, but it feels like every relationship I'm in, it after I'm like sifting through the wreckage and I find the golden key, I'm like, oh great, this will open the door to the next level, and it does, yeah. because oftentimes it directly informs the next relationship. Yeah. And I would also like to say I've dated a, a, a decent gambit of women where what this particular woman is wanting was polar opposite from what this woman is wanting. I'm sure the same thing exists in, in your realm as well. So these conversations that we're having, again, are kind of generalized because I'm sure what your needs and wants are different than yours. I mean, there may be similarities in them, but especially because you were raised in more of a masculine environment and, and you women hold more of the feminine. I was raised in a super masculine. Me That's too. the thing that seems to be a common, I think we're it in is. different stages of our evolution, our own personal right. evolution. But what I'm saying is this. I think we want I think, but what I'm saying, I'm just, I'm going to be, I'm going to be strict and archetypical here for a moment. You have aesthetically more masculine and energetically more masculine energy. Okay. You two women have much more aesthetically and energetically feminine energy. Okay. And that's what I'm referring to. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So it's not, I mean, and uh, yes, we, we live in a patriarchy, so of course we're going to have that sort of upbringing. What I'm saying is, is when I've dated more, more women who are pretty staunchly, you know, solidly energetically masculine, their needs sexually on up to emotionally and physically are often 180 degrees from what I've experienced from women that are pretty solidly rooted in their feminine empowerment. So I just want to say that's an experience that I've had physically. What, and can you elaborate on that? I'm super curious on what that is. Um, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can. I'm just trying to decide how I want to speak. Well, it. let me let me let me throw this out while you're thinking about it, because it might it might help. Because one of the things that has come to my attention, which I was unaware of before, is that as masculine and feminine, there are three kind of basic core needs that we need that you know we're looking for in relationship and, and for us to feel whole and safe. And for like the masculine, the basic needs are respect, a sense of some kind of sense of control, and purpose. So we need to be aware of our purpose. We like to have some kind of control in our lives and feel like we're respected as men. And for the feminine, in most cases, and of course these are grand generalizations, but it's safety, security, and presence or attention. And so like the safety and security sound like the same thing, but safety like a physical safety and security like in the relationship. And then that, that presence, like you're saying, like that I have your attention, you're here with me presence. And I'm wondering if in your experience with masculine women and feminine women if those kind of resonate does the masculine it, it does more... yeah the, the masculine woman that i had in the past she was <laughs> was you know again archetypically stereotypically german like science minded all in the head right like this is what we need to do and you know ask permission before you do anything whereas the women on the other end were more emotionally and like yeah just let it go it'll be fine and if i'm not okay with it then i'll let you know so it was more like the flowy, whereas on this side, it was just like, hang on, let's discuss in full detail what sex is going to look like before we do it. And I mean, I mean I'm mean, i exaggerating, but like, I'm, I'm not too, because she's like, let's be here, let's be, let's be connected one to one. But she goes, but I want permission before you do, like, can I ask permission to touch your leg? Like, yes. Can I ask, you know, it was like, it was like, and this was a year or so plus in a relationship. Whereas the woman I just got out of a relationship with, she's like, after, after the second time, you know what I want, just do it, right? You know, I'm speaking from uh, from sexuality standpoint. So, like, that was a big difference because this woman over here didn't feel safe unless I was going to articulate what I was doing, whereas this one was just like, you already know what I want and what I want to do. So that was a huge difference, right? And so if I tried playing this game over here, it just irritated her. So that's one stark example of it. But again, like what he's saying, just like, right? I forget the words you're saying, but that, that that lines up in that sort of column. Does, does that, that, does that make that sense? Bring up for you guys? Yeah, I'm curious. Oh, nothing. But <laughs> so I'm curious for you. How does that how does that land for you then? Because you had guess, the question. It seems yeah. I mean, I, I would think too. Like maybe there might be also a competition for control or something like that. Oh, yeah. that. And um, but I so along the lines of the flowy, because one of the things that you brought up was. Um, in, in your conscious and in your meditation, you're able to compartmentalize. In your unconscious... Um, ADD? Yeah, but you're able to multitask in a sense, too, and take on multiple things, too, right? So maybe, maybe this is, you know... Um, I also see feel, at least for me, when I'm in a state of flow, I am like... Like the conductor of the orchestra, and it is amazing. But I am like multitasking in a very big way, and I'm, and that felt like flow to me. Are is there a suggestion that that might be unconscious? Um, like for instance, right now, I feel very connected, very present. I'm I'm trying to be really out there and really, and and I have a lot going on in my life right uh -huh, now uh -huh. so the old me probably would have been like thinking about a, a lot of my other stuff I so see. um i'm not sure if i fully got your question what was your question so um and maybe it was just maybe me kind of understanding the articulation of you know so i get what you're saying like you're not present you're like thinking about all these other things that are not relevant to the current moment or, or trying to connect all the different things whereas like right now i would say i'm more the compartmentalizing, I'm really being present here. Yeah. I'm not, you know, thinking about all the things and how they all connect and and similar, you know, in the headspace. I'm just, I'm out here and I'm just, this is it. Like being present in the moment. And then each moment trying to be, um, I think there's a difference between being in the flow and multitasking, doing 8 million things at once and purposefully kind of. Can, can I offer yeah. that too. Um, the last thing that you just said, because I can resonate with what you're saying in that, but I feel the longer 
on the path that I've done my own spiritual work and my own personal growth, the easier it is for me to be here now. I mean, that's mm, like, yeah. right? That's like the mantra, be here now, not there, not in 20 places. Whereas, you know, two, three years ago, I'd be thinking about, you know, sh- I haven't eaten in a while. My What's my bank account looking like? Have I Did I check that email last night? What's going on? And then I'm completely not even here. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that that's the difference. And it's, I'm going to go so far as calling it science versus spirituality, you know, even though that's a very vast difference, different. But people who I've seen are, are they? People as a general who I've seen are academic are kind of what you're saying. You know, or like what you're saying in the past, like I'm here, but I'm thinking about the 20 things that I haven't done yet. And the people who I've met are more in the spiritual realm or on their path doing that are more like, okay, I'm here, cool. I'm just going to disconnect from that and just be here right now. So that's my observation as I have delved both in the world of academia. I am not personally an academic. I've not been to the university officially. So when I interact with those people, I get to see how that feels. And then when I interact with the other people, it's like, oh, wow, that, there's a pretty hefty rift. Kind of like what you were suggesting earlier, like being in the world of finance juxtaposed the world of like energy. I mean, that's... And maybe try on that a step up from that is it's all connected. You know, yeah. sure. science and... Well, it, just, it, well, you know. it, it is, but I'm just saying like that's just my kind of observation yeah. is the people who are more science-y, academic-y are the ones that have, can, like it's the, all the boxes and looking at all, juggling the 12 plates at one time. Mm-hmm. Whereas the work that I've done and I've seen you and other people do with spirituality is like. But I did start in healthcare, pharmaceutical sales. Right. I talked with doctors for 10 years, nurses. I understand how, you know, I understand how it's all beautifully, it is. you yeah. know, kind of connected. And going back like 15 minutes ago to mm-hmm. something <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming back. Um, let's see. I think. Yet. I should have like interjected when it came, but I think I think fundamentally we all want the same thing. Yeah. You know how, how we talked about you know masculine versus feminine, women and men, and we want different things. I think it all actually comes down to like where we are in our development, mm-hmm. and that's how we show up and what we attract in a partner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why for me, I sometimes I attract the really sweet feminine guys, and then sometimes really military guys. Um, but I think as we do the work to evolve and become more and more whole or enlightened, that all of us, men and women, want the same thing. We want to deeply connect, vulnerably connect on such a deep level, and we want to be our masculine and our feminine and both of us to be really balanced. Mm-hmm. I think that's... Yeah, I did a, this with, with Dave Glazer again today, and I talked to you about that. We were having a conversation about there's no stopping you know, this is about awareness, and so we make these generalizations so we can kind of get some awareness around the differences between masculine and feminine and kind of the needs we, we need, but then we don't stop there. That's like, okay, now we have this awareness, now let us grow and see how this, how we work this into our life and stuff. And so it's like, this is not the ending, it's the beginning. This is, like, you know, step one, it's the middle. and we're moving, we're moving forward, and so we're doing this awareness piece because that way we can become more in line, we can become more in the moment. And to your point, Jennifer, I think there's two, there's almost two different mindsets around the, like the multitasking thing. Because when you're present in the moment, kind of in that centered zone space, that's when there's that flow. Versus yeah. the mental, oh my god, because that mental space is a lot of times, you know, the linear uh, left brain. You know, I've got to do all these things. I'm thinking in the present. I'm thinking in the past. I'm doing all this, you know, versus being present in the moment and having that flow state. You know, being in the zone and having you know things just kind of work as they need to work, and you know that's where I think a lot of the work comes from, getting out of the head into the body, yeah. and going, okay, what's ne- what's needed now? To your point, like what is needed now? Mm-hmm. Am I am I needed to be my masculine now? Am I needed to be my feminine? Am I needed to hold space? <clears throat> you know, like and well, there's there's actually I have a video on my website. One of my mentors said this to me this uh, spring on a road trip. It's not what's next, it's what's now. Because for me, I'm thinking about making dinner while I'm eating breakfast. Yeah. And how do you enjoy your breakfast? I don't. I don't even remember it. What did I have for breakfast, right? Yeah. And so in that, the same thing happens. It's like kind of coming to the heart center space. You know, it's like every moment something is shifting and evolving. And, and I don't know if all of you know this, but there is anger. But anger is a capstone to, to fear 
beneath that is sadness. So sadness, if you see someone acting out, either out of fear or anger, more than likely not, the bedrock to that is sadness. Because in my personal experience and in work that I've done with other people, you know, the front is because you, I, mean, I need to keep you from this vulnerability that I have that I don't want any of you to see because it hurts. And I don't want you to see my wound, so I'm going to lash out, push you away, do anything I can to help keep you from experiencing what I'm feeling. And if and when this wall actually goes away and I can trust you, then you'll see this really wounded person in the room. And I don't really want you to see that. So that's what the man's facade is about. Um, and I'm sure women have that too. In fact, I know women have that too. So with that, that's another heart center thing. But the other thing I want to talk about from a nature-based sort of idea is there's seasons. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm new here, so I don't know how dynamic they get. But like in the east, you have a very discernible spring, summer, yeah, autumn, yeah. winter. It'll but, be 80, and then it'll be right. snowing. So more. that's what I'm saying. So it's like a bipolar person here. <laughs> so in, in Michigan, it's just like once the snow hits, it's like, all right, button up, because we're in this for the next three months, and that's what it's going to be. So I mean, it's very sort of predictable. And yes, there's the, the anomalies. And I actually have a, a tattoo of a four-season tree on my leg to remind me of this, because what I'm feeling now if I experience something, I could be feeling happy, and then, you know, a person from my past who's wounded me deeply could walk in, and all of a sudden I'm feeling locked down, shame, hurt, like that, right? Or something is said, or I'm triggered by, you know, something that was said or interacted, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm in a completely different place. So being fully present with that, being within here, right? Someone in a, so I'm also an empath, so I can sense when people shift even subtly, if I'm tuning into them. Um, and in that, it's like, oh, what just happened there? I mean, someone, it could look like nothing even shifted, but if I'm talking with you, I'm actually connected with you, and I watch you shift, I can, I can physically sense like a shift between comfortable and uncomfortable. I'm not in this moment directly connected to you, so I can't really tell where you're at with that. But I'm just saying like shifting happens, and from a heart-centered space, like is that kind of what you're talking about? Like, it's like being there coming from that place of what's alive now and how can we interact and expand from this place. Well, I, I feel your heart set and connectedness and the yeah. fact that you're in your body right now. Yeah. I can feel that from you. I don't know what you're asking me. Oh, you're just talking because, about, well, yeah. you're, you're talking about like when you're trying to connect with this, and you're talking about this man you were dating oh, and you're trying yeah. to connect in with him. Yes. And yeah. you couldn't and he probably couldn't perceive that was the process. Even, even, even a vast okay. shift. Okay. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. That's the process Season. that we, that we yeah. when we're not okay, doing yeah. the work. I'm, I'm on board now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, I, yeah. some of the, since, we, since we're getting down to like 15 minutes, one, some of the practical things that I wanted to bring up, one of the things that has come up quite a lot lately, and I you know, did that podcast with David, cause, and so that'll be out in two weeks, so you get another version of that to listen to. But we have this training that communication is about who's right. And he was talking about, you know, my story, your story, you know, kind of the realm of now, realm of meaning, like, okay, here's an event that happened. It doesn't mean anything. Then here's two people who see this event or experience this event and go, well, this means this to me and this means this to me. And we're both right because this is my experience. Mm -hmm. How do we connect with that experience? And it's, do we come from a place of being right? Or do we come from a place of understanding? And I believe that's the biggest shift is I want to understand. I know you're right. I know what you feel and what you believe about whatever this is. I want to understand. And I actually had to have an experience today that led right into that because I was having a public discussion with a guy on Facebook and being tongue-in-cheek guy talk, gave some kind of advice, and then it was not received well. And then it escalated quickly. And fortunately, because of the training and because of the work I do, I didn't do the normal shutdown like, well, you don't you don't understand me, and you know now I'm the little boy hiding in, inside. I was like, no, I want to understand. And so I pursued until we had a conversation. Then I understood that we both misunderstood each other. Mm -hmm. We were both kind of coming from tongue-in-cheek, but took it as a, a tag and all that. And mm -hmm. some of the tools that, especially in relationship, because we're always in, we're, we're, we're in such flux, especially in our world today. I mean, we have this whole conversation over here. Take a break. 
Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's filling their plate up so much, we don't mm-hmm. even have to take time for ourselves. And we're expected to interact with people and have these intimate conversations when we're not even sure who we are or where we are at that moment. And it's such this flux of being able to go, okay, I want to understand you and be able to respond in a moment of, I don't think we understand each other because there's a, a trigger, there's a reaction happening. And so there's a, a, a very powerful question and, and statement that I think every relationship should put at the top of their list. And it's, what I heard you say was, because I'm feeling triggered right now, so what I heard you say was, and 99999999 percent of the time, that's not what you said. That was their definition or representation, their you know, version of it. And then the question is, what did you hear me say? When you say something, and especially, I know I had this conversation with a friend who actually inspired me to do this. When she was trying to be helpful and give advice or be helpful, and her husband would get pissed off, shut down, leave, she didn't understand. She's like, I'm trying to be helpful. But without the awareness of nice guy syndrome or the emasculation of what we take that as, that you're being helpful, it triggers us that, oh, well, I'm not a real man because she needs to help me and I don't have all the answers. And so it was just this kind of awareness of like, if in that moment, if she had gone, well, okay, I was attempting to be helpful, what did you hear me say? And he might have said something like, well, I heard you say I'm not a man and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I don't know what I'm talking about. Not, oh, you're trying to help me. Oftentimes it's the messages that are underneath the words that are the trigger, not the words themselves. Yeah. Well, to your and the point, interpretation of that message. Yeah. yeah. And to your point of being present in a heart space, you can feel what's underneath. And so a lot, a lot of the, you know, when you're with somebody and you take the time to learn to connect, the words become secondary mm-hmm. because you are present and you are connected. And when we learn to do that in a relationship, you become that nice dynamic, that nice flow. And then you almost don't even have to ask questions. You know, it's like, do you need me to fix you right now? Like, I'll let you go. You can feel like, right? And well, a better question is, is what are you needing? Yeah, what do you need right now? Because that's not making any assumptions on my behalf. You know? Mm-hmm. One, and, and that goes and both directions, yeah, too. That's not, a, that's not a one-way road thing. Well, that's the whole thing. It, it's always both directions. And, right. and, and taking responsibility of, like, yeah. in this moment, what I need is, and I know I've had this conversation with many people, you know, what we, especially if you're going to date guys that may not be doing the work or may not be as far along in the work, a little caveat will save you a whole lot of heartache. Like, I'm going to vent right now. I don't want you to fix it. I don't want you to tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Just stay here and listen. So I can be seen and heard, and maybe afterwards I'll ask your opinion. And what, and as for, as the men, what we need to understand, what we're, we're working on as holding space, is to be able to sit in that space, the whole space, and not feel as triggered because 99% of the time when we're trying to fix it, it's because we're uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You're the lady we love. You're emotional, and we feel triggered because you're emotional. We want to fix it. And that's our job archetypically. Is archetypically to is to fix, and that's. And it's also the old space. Right. You know? And if we can't fix, then we are worthless. Right. So if we keep hearing just wh- how you're feeling and we're not given permission or allowance to fix, we feel worthless. Mm-hmm. Just know that. It's, part it's of that kind pattern. of a really weird thing, but it's totally true. So mm-hmm. the fir- I literally had had a woman I was dating 10 years ago say that to me. She goes, look, let's need to talk. I don't want to hear anything out of your mouth. I just want to talk and vent. My male brain, 10 years ago before I had quote woke up, was great. I'm off the hook now. Sweet. I can just sit here, you know, whatever. That was how I thought. And I was like, great. But, I mean, I have a completely different perspective now on it. So, but, yeah, sometimes being that blunt is really what a man mm-hmm. of that needs to hear. Well, that's a great point because that's something we didn't even touch on because we got so – we went down the rabbit hole in a different direction, but just how we communicate. You know, ladies oh, – this is yeah. – Ladies – being blunt and, and actually saying, and that's that was kind of that. that well, we kind of started with this with the teal swan thing, yeah. actually. Well, yeah. and, and even like that, what I was trying to get on with that little yin yang analogy was that we're communicating, like, I'm going to communicate with you as I would communicate with a man and wonder why you don't understand me, versus you're going to communicate with me like you would communicate with a lady, understanding, you know, wonder why we don't understand. Like, we are very direct and very linear. Jason, stop. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and there's there's so many jokes. There's so many comedians that make these jokes about, you know, a woman will come out of the bathroom and say, there's no toilet paper in the house. The guy's sitting on the couch and go, okay. Because there was no direct call to action. It was, okay, I'll make a mental note, put that on the list, and next time I go to the store, I'll get toilet paper. But the lady's going, okay, I've just told you there's no toilet paper in the house. Get off your lazy butt and go get toilet paper. That's not what she says. That's what she means. That's good. That's really good. You know, and so that's why being direct and going, you know, and it may take a, you know, it's, it's a retraining. It's a new skill. It may take a man where you're like, okay, there's no toilet paper in the house. Wouldn't All right, that be seen as being bossy? Not necessarily, and that's one of the differences between men and well, women. Well, that's what we kind of talked about on the outset of this is like there's like a man, a woman can't speak her truth with passion without being perceived as being bossy. Right. Like, right. But that's something you got to get over, especially in a relationship, because men are direct. I'll say things to him that would come across <clears> as rude, because we're like, okay, let's get. Like, some what, it, like what it just did with him. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, stop. No. And then he kept going. That was just yeah. like. You know, Am I playing with him? That's 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 that directness where you know the lady you, you have this emotional flexible like feeling nature where you're like you know what they're saying without them saying it. We don't. So, so in oh. so I was just like in that book Wild Attraction it, it'd be a great you know if you're writing down titles there's actually an exercise in there that I did with my the woman I was dating where it's <clears throat> around this idea of like direct communication versus indirect communication and so we tried it on. I said, okay, tell me something you tell me like that. Mm -hmm. And then she said it directly, how like a man should hear it. She goes, oh, wow, that sounds like it was being really harsh to you. I said, no, like, I got it. That's how I need you to communicate with me. She's like, really? I said, yeah, she goes, that's that, that's hard. And this is an enlightened woman who's been doing her work for like 10 plus years. She's like, wow, that was really hard for me to be that direct with you. I said, but that, if you need to get me, get a message across, like you just need to throw like the nail in my forehead. To, to get it across, and then we flipped it. So I did, you know, whatever the message was, I did some sort of like, yeah. oh, you know, I'm feeling really cold right now. It's, I wish, you know, I don't know what to do about that, you know. Oh, can I get you a blanket? Yeah, that'd be great. As opposed to, I was raised, that's passive aggressive. <laughs> that's how a man perceives that sort of energy. And then if I said to her, hey, I'm cold, get me a jacket, all of a sudden I'm being like that. So it's really interesting. So if you want to have fun with it, like a guy friend, try it on just for fun, like a non-romantic connection. Like just have the both of you try it on if you really want. It's it, it's it's fun and uh, educational. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. eye-opening. Plus, it's their tools in their toolbox. Yeah. So you don't necessarily whip it out every time. But when you want to get your point across, you keep doing it. So. I guess where, like earlier, you both said, and especially you, Brian, that – um, a woman doesn't want a man to unload all of his baggage or his his feelings on a deep level. Mm -hmm. That on a deep level, you should com communicate with men. Kind of, I think I I was feeling like similar to that. Like, oh, guys don't probably don't want really abrasive. Real. So where is that line? Because when you said that, actually, I again the, the older guy. There was nothing he couldn't say. I liked when he got really emotional. Right. And so hearing this, like, where is that line between well, me being direct and me being, like, bossy or the, bitchy? You actually kind of hit the nail on the head in the question with the older guy because he can share without dumping, mm -hmm. which it's a fine line. Yeah. But it's, mm -hmm. He's owned his stuff, so he's just sharing. He's not wanting you to fix it. He's just sharing where he's at. He's just sharing, and it's not about dumping on you mm -hmm. for you to own or anything. So it's a big difference, but it's a really fine line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. Or, so the second part of the question, where is that line between being direct and like being bossy or bitchy? Or? Yeah, you have to be present in the moment. To, yeah. And you'll yeah, say that that's a case by case basis. Yeah. Because yeah. unfortunately, and, and and I think you know, kind of like the example, you may try it out and go, okay, I tried the, hey, I'm feeling cold, the window's open, versus give me a, my jacket. You know, it may just be just a practice thing. Like, okay, I've, I've tried this way. This didn't work. Let's mm -hmm. be more direct. Yeah. And, and, and then working and, and finding that balance. And I think the presence thing, being in the body, being in the mm -hmm. moment, you go, you'll feel. You know, sometimes he's not there. You're like, hey, look at me. Where are you? What? Yeah. I was in my nothing box. What do you need? 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So the one thing I was thinking though, um, with the, the not all the con- there was like a, a flip in the conversation of being direct. It's like so like I have no toilet paper and like there was <laughs> one point in that though where there was an ask of being more um, that men want to fix and mm-hmm. so allow them oh. the opportunity yeah. to fix it. Yeah. And that that's how they feel purposeful. Right. That's also codependency, though. Yes. So I don't think that there's actually permission in that. I think that that there is an opportunity for people to stand in their own and communicate freely. And I think it's up to women to say what we what we are thinking or what we're feeling or what we need, and having a man respond to that without feeling like. You're not giving me anything to fix. I'm not feeling like a man. That's codependency. Instead of being like that, standing in your own and. Well, and that's kind of where that caveat comes from. Like, yeah. I just want you to listen right now. Yeah. If I need you to fix something, I'll tell you. But right now, I need to. I just want to share. So I and, like, that, and that and that actually is giving us a call to action. It's like, okay, I'm gonna hold space. Versus, I'm looking for something. But then to that's fix. still. But what you're taking from that though is still <clears throat> a. That's my job. Of of like that's what I need to do is is hold space. And so that's, you're getting a positive hit from that. It really should just be like, just being is my thought. That, that is, that's Sorry. The, again, no, please. And this is beautiful because this is a huge frigging spike. A lot of men are, have been raised in a severely codependent family. Yes. And women too. too. Right. So in that, it's a both and. Uh-huh. Because archetypically, men are the fixers. They're the ones that are building the houses, they're fixing the things, they're out in the fields, and they're doing. Uh-huh. Give a man a task, and he'll be happy all day long. Because I and, think... and, But if you, like for me, you put me in a room and just say, hang out here for 10 minutes, great, 10 minutes, awesome. This actually happened to me a, a month and a half ago. I was told, you know, I was with, with when I was just in a relationship with, I don't know, I and, and this would make sense to women, it didn't make sense to me. Um, I, I have some stuff to do, and we're t- together on a trip in California. Go hang out in Huntington Beach for a bit, and um, I'll let you know when I'm done. So it's like, well, are you going to be done in two hours, four hours, six hours? I can't tell you. So it's like, I need, I need like, a, a, give me a, give me, give me, give me a ballpark here. But she couldn't, and so that created a, 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 a conflict and an argument between the two of us. And so she was just being in the flow, like you spoke earlier, and I just needed some context to work with inside of. And I feel like a lot of men have that issue. So if she would say, I'm going to be gone until 8 p.m. tonight, awesome. Right. I know what I can do now. Yeah. I have that game which I can play. Right. But by her being vague and nebulous about it, it just drove me nuts. Yeah. And I don't know, can, I mean, that, I feel like that's a male archetypical it is. thing. Well, and that's, that's part so of it. So does too. that make sense? I mean, so yeah, it's a codependent and it's a male archetypical yeah. thing too. Because it, it may come across co- uh, codependent, but it really is working with, and that's the awareness, acknowledging what we as men and what you know you as women need just in our masculine and feminine because we're task-oriented as men. And the, the feminine is naturally relationship-oriented. And so we would like to have some structure, some, you know, our little box. We need to have our little box. So if you're coming in to share, just give it, you know, it's like, okay, I don't need your opinion right now. I, I need you just to listen. That gives us our, our reference box. So it's not necessarily codependent, but it's actually going, this is what I need from you. It's ho- okay, I see what you're saying. It's kind, of wor- it's kind of working with the masculine with what they need. It's the just politeness like, of, of working with the different needs. Yeah. yeah and and just, it's, it's subtleties. Mm-hmm. It really is. And it's, mm-hmm. it's moment to moment, too. That's where the presence comes right. in. Cause but, yeah, because there's, there's some days that she could say, I'll be gone all day. I'd say, great, I'm going to go do my own thing. Yeah. Yeah. But there's but that day where I'm feeling like I need that sort of connection. Like, I need – so, it, again, it, it's really – Is that a communication of the need? Yeah. 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 So that's why – I mean, all, honestly, like, all – Problems that I've experienced in life, be it friends, lovers, family, coworkers, all break down to we have a problem with communication. Yeah. We had a failure to communicate. <laughs> right? all it all boils down to that. So I just want to just note this is Kirk is saying a possible question for women. Are you having trouble meeting men today that have the ability to be present? Or the second question is, is how would you describe healthy masculinity as women? <laughs> yeah, I know. And a hush falls over the crowd. <laughs> uh, so, not nowadays. I mean, I feel like, you know, I've been on this journey since 2012, and just now I'm in this amazing realm of attracting, you know, men that are interested in 
doing the work to be very balanced and you know from the landmark the course of miracles and so now i see a plethora of men doing the good work you're doing that kirk's doing that you know all of the all of them are doing here here in denver that's good that's not everybody's experience though but also it's a phase of development three years ago when i moved here you know i kept attracting emotionally unavailable men right didn't see that was this the classroom i was in you know of really digging deeper and healing within myself yeah uh what was the second question what's your definition of a healthy masculine having that balance of doing it all i do it all you know i do the business and then i fall into my feminine and i play and i cook and and i'm striving daily to be in my heart to be in my presence to be and so i definitely want a man and i think the definition of healthy masculinity is a man that can embody both right all of us humans embody both our masculine and our feminine beautiful oh that was great yeah that was really really good yeah well awesome well we've run out of our time which is not true but i want to be honoring of <laughs> your time and you know i know some of you get up early and meditate <laughs> and do things so i want to make sure you get you out of your time but i want to thank everybody on facebook live i want to thank brian thank, thank you, all you thank guys you here Jason for and uh, yeah. this will not be the last time we do this so That's make sure to really add good. more questions invite your friends and we will see you guys soon. All right? Love yes. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yay! Yay! I can't finish. It, it doesn't want to stop. Oh, no! We can't stop we the can't train! We can't stop. <laughs> there we go. Slow it down. So thank you for...